pursuing discipline, and we have been dealing with the subject of commitment um, as one of those areas that if we're going to pursue discipline, we got to be committed. And what I want to do tonight is look at a number of scriptures throughout the Bible that focuses on the issue or the subject called commitment so that we can better understand it is no joke. When he talks to us about commitment, it is an awesome responsibility, okay? The first thing I want to take a look at is the fact that it is found in David's cry to God. That's the first one. It is found in David's cry to God. And the scripture is Psalm 63, verse 1. Psalm 63, verse 1. This is David crying out to God. And we're going to take a moment and examine David's cry so that we can get a clear understanding of this issue or the subject called commitment, okay? If you have the New King James Version, it simply says, early, early will I seek you. So listen to what David says. Oh God, you are my God. Early, Will I seek you? My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. The first thing that this text teaches us is that it tells us that David was not casual about his relationship with God. David was very, very serious when it came to his relationship with God. In fact, the text says he yearns for him earnestly. Now, if you have the King James Version versus the New King James Version, the King James Version puts early in the place of earnestly that you will find in the NIV. You got me? So if somebody sitting here got the NIV, it says earnestly. But the King James Version uses the word early. That is fine. We'll get into that. The key is the word seek because the verb seek is a very unusual verb found in this verse. It comes from a Hebrew noun which happens to be dawn. That's the word dawn, just like dawn, okay? The word dawn can be translated two ways, and I've already given them to you. One is to seek early. The other one is to seek earnestly. Now, I know some of y'all might wonder why is that important, because I never want you to get thrown off when you pick up one translation and you pick up another one they had a right to choose whichever term they wanted. So some would say early, others will say earnestly. That means this, and this is what the text is teaching us. The text is teaching us that seeking God is, in other words, it's possible, he said, it is the first action of the day. Am I making sense to you? That means before you even seek to do anything, your objective is to do what? Seek God. 
But it also has a flip side to that. And that is, it teaches us the, that he had a, an, an ambition throughout the day to seek God. So not just what? Early in the morning. So you, you, you see where the issue is. N none of that is, is a problem. What I think is most important is that we understand David had an objective. And his objective was, I'm going to seek God. Whether it's, if he does it early in the morning, it sets the pace for the day. If he does it throughout the day, that's all right with me too. You got me? Now, he pursued God despite any circumstance. Now, that's important because most of us don't pursue God when hell breaks loose. We talk about God, but we don't pursue God. Am I making, does everybody hear what I'm saying? That's a problem, okay? So that tells us already that David was committed in his relationship with God. So the very first thing I need you to understand that it is found in David's cry to whom? The Lord. That's, it's, he said, early I will do what? Seek you. And we can go a little deeper than that. We can talk about the fact that if you did it when they got up in the mornings, you, you give God whatever the day is going to bring. None of us know what the day going to bring, okay? Can you hold your question? Uh, say, I won't hear it. Oh, I, I'm talking like, whew. I'm going to give it. I'm, I'm going I'm to give you that, that, that opportunity. The deal is, uh, I've already messed up, so <laughs> just, it's, go, go on and ask Courtney. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. Yes. But most of us don't. We talk about him. There's a difference. You know, we even will tell you, some of us pray, but we don't pray effectively. We just pray. <laughs> but I, when we talk about seeking, we're going, the, the second one might help us predicate it on that statement. The second thing is that it is found in God's promise to the captives in Babylon. Let me say that again. It is found in God's promise to the captives in Babylon. Okay? I'm going to give you a chance to write that. I hope y'all ain't writing. It is found. All you had to write was captives in Babylon. The first one, it is found in David's cry to God. Now it is found in the promise to the captives in Babylon. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13. Team. All right. Listen to this. You got to get it this time. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. That verse, Jeremiah 29, 13, is one of the most outstanding 
evangelistic verses, you will find. It's filled with me. Note also that it is the glorious promise and it is given to all and to any. Got me? It's given to whomever. You, you don't see an issue or a problem. He said, and you will seek me. Capital me. It's capital M. And find me when you search for me with all your what? Heart. This verse contains a number of valuable spiritual nuggets about God. I'm going to give you a few of them. And they're all caught right in that verse. You ready? The very first one is, it teaches us that God is accessible. Woo! Now that, that right there alone tells you God is not hiding somewhere. <laughs> He, he, he's not hiding somewhere. He, he's making himself known. The problem is, we don't want to go about finding him based on his plan. So the very first thing you see in the verse, he is accessible. Number two, it teaches us that we have a responsibility. All right? We have a responsibility. And the responsibility in the verse is seek him. That, that's personal. That's, that's not, you, you can't cry and say, Lord, I don't know where you are. No, no, none of us can, can, can do that. The problem is we don't know how to seek him. You hear me? We're going we to get into this. All right. Talking about commitment now. Third thing that you find in the text is that it teaches us the quality required in a true seeker. The quality that is required in dealing with a true seeker. Let me tell you what it is. With all your heart, not a piece of your heart, not half heartedly, with all your Hard. Mm. Now I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about a few things in this verse. And this is where Satan trips us up. <sighs> You can't be a pretty, cute, dignified, graceful hunter. I already lost some of y'all because, see, you, you can't go, if, if you see your game, you, you, you got to deal with it. And, and you can't be telling me, oh, I, I, oh, wait, I can't get over that in, in the in bush. My stockings. My heels going to get muddy. All right, now listen to me good. This is why in the text he says, with all your heart. He wants all or none. In seeking him, 
you have to tune out people and stuff. I tell y'all this all the time. I haven't seen it much, but a lot of times when we come to worship, we are too concerned about what other folk think. And most of y'all sitting here operate on those bases. When you are really desperate and you are after an answer from God, you don't care. I'm, I'm being serious now. When, when a problem has, has gotten you to you are broken and you've been praying for a long time, you really don't care. See, a real worshiper will let go and let God. Okay? But why would the writer use this word seek? Notice where it said, and you will seek me. Now let's talk about it for a moment. We get messed up because we figure I came to church Sunday. I prayed. I talked to the pastor. I told the deacons to pray for me. And a whole week is gone. And God ain't done nothing. Then somebody got to call you. And then you say, well, I'm, I'm dealing with it. I, I won't be at church. You got a problem. Can I tell you what your problem is? You're not a seeker. See, you ever lost something, but you knew it wasn't outside the house, it was inside, you just couldn't figure out where you put it? If you really wanted it bad enough, you turn the sofa upside down, you take the broom, and you pull out everything under the bed, and before you realize it, you just about turn the house upside down. But when you get it, when you get your hands on, you got it. You know why you got it? You were a seeker. God does not move just because you came after him this time. There are moments you got to keep praying and keep praying and keep praying and keep praying because he lines up your faith with your ability to seek him. Oh, I sure hope I'm making some sense. Does everybody understand? And you can't quit. No, no, no. Not if you want to answer. See, don't ask me why he does this. But we're going to get into this when we kick off Sunday with his miracles. He just dealt with people differently. And you will wonder sometimes, why? Why? Why would you not just treat us all the same? That when you step in, you fix it. Not so. Not so at all. I mean, why was it necessary for God to have to deal with Moses with a rod? I mean, come on now. You got the power. Divide the Red Sea. Tell the man walk on cross. It's done deal. But he turns around and said, hold it. What, what you got in your hand? What, what I got to do with your miracle? Am I, does everybody hear what I'm saying? So in the text he says, and you will seek me. And here's the punchline. If you seek me the right way, you will find me. Boy, what is the right way? To seek earnestly with all your heart. See, sometimes trouble will not remove itself because you're in the seeking process. And he knows in your spirit you really seeking him cute. I can tell y'all ain't had a problem. I can tell some of y'all really. I'm talking about a person with a real down-to-earth problem tears rolling down their cheek and they sitting in church and ain't saying a mum the word just sitting there crying they got a problem but they seeking him 
It's like, God, I ain't going to quit. That's the kind of commitment that God desires of us. That seeking God is not only the first action of the day, throughout the day. Because nobody knows when you wake up in the morning, you don't know where hell is in that day. You just got up. So you have to be careful that when it knocks at your door around two, you got me? You, you don't get to tell me, wait a minute, Lord. I talked to you this morning. Why is this happening? You need to hush. Now is the time to say, God, I know you heard me this morning. And I know you're with me. I'm going to seek you again. I need your help. Y'all ain't had no problem. Y'all ain't had no problem. So this word seek, I need you to listen to this. That seeking God is not only to be your first action. Stay with me now. But don't let Satan rob you of the blessings of the day and you get lost at 3 o'clock. You, if you're going to call on him, be one of them kind of saints that get up from the desk. Go in the restroom and close the stall door. Boy, y'all sitting up here looking at me like. I'm talking about at work. And sit on the toilet. The door closed. Don't nobody know what's going on. And you ain't got to talk out loud. Just talk to him. You got to seek him. Can't be cute and pretty. Okay? And that time, you just have to get, get loose. Okay? All right. So you should have two things. Listen to what he says now. Here's the, here's the word that I was about to jump over it. Write the word find. Okay? That means after seeking, after searching, after looking, you find his promise. That's why I stand sun after sun and say, when you got a problem, don't stay home. This is the best time to get your butt to church because when you can seek him and you know you're dealing with something, and you're, but we'll tell everybody, about the situation, and I'm not against what we, what we do sometimes, but the person who can fix that thing for you is who you need to be after. Because sometimes you can come through those doors, and even with the choir, they can sing something that hits bullseye. Hits bull, and it's like, it's like God. You, you, you had to have known. He did. He had changed things. Okay? That, that, I, I, re, I listened to Brother Shelley the other Sunday telling y'all I had a sermon prepared. And Holy Spirit said, it's ready, but that ain't what you're going to deal with. Yeah, that's a scary thing, though. It, it's, to, it's to have that word, and then he goes, but you might well put that up. You know, I've done that at revivals, and I'm like, oh, God, do you really mean that? And he said, yeah. I said, do, do you know, it's been about five, six years. He said, don't worry about that. It's, it's a store. It's a closet back here. And God will unlock that door and bring all. But if you would ask me something on my own,
Next thing I want to deal with in that verse, he says, with all your heart. You, you got to give him all you got. Now, I'm going to go somewhere, and y'all might frown, but you just frown. There are moments that God will get a praise out of you. Yeah. Sometimes to forget about yourself is to let the problem stay with you. See, the, the more he removes stuff, the more comfortable we become. Yeah. So there are moments the problem ain't going nowhere. So you got a choice. Remember the question? So, Smith, the statement you made when you said you heard him say, praise me, give me glory, and you got to thinking about what other folk would think, he won't let the problem go. Because the only way we praise him sometime is when he leaves us in a storm. Whew. All right. So you got, let me back up. Number one. It is found in David's cry to whom? To God. Secondly, it is found in God's promise to the captives in Babylon. Okay? All right. Number three. It occurs in Paul's pressing own statement. That's where I'm going to put it. It occurs in Paul's pressing own statement. Amen. Right? What am I talking about? We're going to go to Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. All right, once again, commitment, commitment, okay? Listen to what Paul says. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. First thing, it appears in this verse that the Apostle Paul likens his own life to that of runners in these Greek games. Okay, keep in mind, much of what Paul would write about was that which the people were familiar with. So if Jesus and Paul were here today, they, they would probably talk a lot about what's happening now, uh, how our young folk dealing with candy, the rocks. Okay, he, he, he deal with guns. Bullets and drugs. And so the games were that which was very familiar to Paul. We learn something in verse 12. In verse 12, we learn that Paul was neither complacent. That's not what you're going to find in this statement. Nor was he apathetic. Regarding his spirituality. Now I can stop right there and just teach on that. Because too many Christians become satisfied with where they are. So we, we, we never seek to do anything greater than what we are dealing with. On the level in which we are dealing with. 
So when we look then at Philippians chapter 3 verse 12, three things, three things. We may not finish them tonight. I'm going to lift from the text and these three things will help us better understand what Paul is dealing with. Very first thing I need you to write down is that he had not received everything. Let me say that again. He had not received everything. I see you, man. <laughs> All right. Everybody hear me? Now, you, you may ask, where did I get it from? It's in the text. Let me show it to you. Listen to what Paul says. Not that I have what? Attained. Here's the first thing. Paul is telling us that he had not arrived at his final goal. Can I tell you why some Christians park at certain successes? They don't see their final goal. See, you got to understand, if all you see is day by day, you're in trouble. You, you, got that, you got to have a goal set far more than where you are right now. You can't look at yourself and say, well, evidently, this is all the Lord wants. And, and, and we as a race of folk got that bad. We, we, we'll, we'll have three pennies and then God will bless us with a nickel and we've arrived. We move from three pennies to a nickel. Have mercy if he gave us a dime, we would just be off the chain. Paul is telling us, I got more ground to cover. All right, let's take a look at the terms that Paul uses in the verse. The word attained in this verse is from a different Greek word than in the preceding verse, which is verse 11. You got your Bibles open, don't you? All right. You, just, you should see it in verse 11. But I told you it's a what? Different word. In verse 11 of the text, it means to arrive at as at a goal. You got me? That's what he meant in verse 11. In verse 12, it speaks of an appropriation. In other words, he has not yet appropriated. He hadn't arrived. He see where he needs to go, but he hadn't gotten there yet. What hurts us as Christians, we don't spend enough quality time with God so God can tell you what it is he going to get out of you. There's more to come than what meets the eye. You with me? I could go somewhere with this, and I think I will. Let, 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 me, let me teach it like this. Some couple of years back, if I was not careful, I could have gotten messed up. See, you got to be careful how you receive compliments and how people say things. I'm talking, what is it, 2019? Mm, 14, 13, 15, back, back when, when folding chairs were being put out down the aisle. And the Holy Spirit spoke and he said, don't get excited. I said, what? He said, don't get, you heard me, don't get excited. I said, don't get excited. What do you mean? Don't evaluate success on numbers. 
Because if you study well the word, God like to reduce. <laughs> he, he, he only, and, and see, there's a reason. He, he takes a handful and works wonders. But I had to ask, if, why bring folk you don't want me to get excited? He said, because everything you see, I didn't bring. So you have to be careful how you view your life. Am I making sense to y'all? Don't get comfortable. Because there's some things you have not yet attained. And he's going to get it out of you now if you are willing to work with him. See, we're in a transition right now. Everybody can't handle it. I'm just telling y'all up front. Everybody can't handle where we are right now. Because we becoming real. Yeah, we becoming real. See, some of us got excited back then with numbers. Emotionalism. And I, let me say this because I was approached. I was approached by one of our members. And the um, um, person I need to be saying this to need, to need to hear it again. They ain't even here. But just in case they told somebody else sitting here and you ain't got, you know, the gall to come to me, I'm going to tell it. The, the, the point that they were making was, they said, Pastor, I need, I need to ask you something. Um, you, 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 don't, you don't care that much for emotionalism. I said, where did you get that from? You don't care about that much about emotionalism. I said, where, where did you get that from? And, and I said, he said, well, I, I've, heard, I've heard you pray. I said, no, you didn't. I said, you misunderstood what I've said. I've never stood in this pulpit and said it's a sin to shout. Never told nobody that. Never, 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 never. I have said be careful that you don't let your emotions outrun you spiritually. Now that I have done. But I never told nobody. In fact, I will say don't waste your time on somebody shouting. Because if they fake, that's between them and God. And most of us will watch what somebody else is doing. So that taught me that this person don't, doesn't know how to listen. So I had to say, oh, now I know what the problem is. You too pretty to shout. <laughs> and you are thinking that you want to justify what I did not say so you can stay comfortable in the zone you in. Boy. Paul says, Paul says, he had not yet, what, attained. I have not arrived at this. Paul had not yet received everything. Why? Because he had sense enough to know that God had more in store for him. Boy, I hope I'm making some sense. See, you can't stop being committed because when you cease being committed, you lose blessings. Get all God got for you. How important is this? God is a giving God and he will continue to give to those watchmen now who want more. See y'all, yeah, see that's, I know that I messed up some folk now, no, nah, that ain't right. What you mean that ain't right? That's, that's right. If you can handle it, it's yours. See, the problem is us can't handle it because too much changes us. So Paul starts off by simply saying, he had not received everything. Stop rubbing two nickels together 
and developing an attitude, I have arrived. Now I'm going to go someplace else. That's what happened to New Horizon. Spirit wise. Stay with me. When we were over at the funeral parlor, Brain at Rec Center, you couldn't run us away on a Wednesday night. Shouting and praising God all in that woman's funeral parlor. Tight, but it was right. And his presence was up in there. Then we marched in here. We changed. We got to build it. Pray off. Number two, number two, number two. Not only had he not received everything, he had not become everything. He had not become everything. Notice in the text, Paul doesn't say, not that I have already attained and as a period. He says, or am already perfected. And I'm not, I'm, I'm trying to teach us because y'all hear me say these things. We learn two passages of scripture. We buy a nice, good looking Bible. And we read it for church. We made it. You talking Paul now. Let's talk about this word perfected. This word perfected or perfection or perfect. Whatever translation you got. In the Greek, it does not mean sinless perfection. That's not what he's talking about. Okay. Instead, Paul is talking about being spiritually mature. Amen. Big difference. Amen. So that ought to cause us to get rid of that lazy excuse we come up with. Yeah. Want, me, want me to tell y'all what it is? Yeah. Some of us in here have said, well, you know, I'm going to die with something. It's, you know, God knows that uh, I'm, I'm doing the best I can. You missed the whole boat. He's not talking about sinless perfection. We all know that no matter who we are, we're going to have some shortcomings. But there ought to be some growth in us that... Ten years from today, you ought not be the person you are now. If you are, some wrong somewhere. Am I making sense to you? Got two little babies over there, grandchildren. Now, little, little boy there, little William, he, he doing quite well with no teeth. He, he, he chewing whatever you can chew. But my point that I need y'all to understand, he's a baby. But we got folk in the church with that kind of mentality and they've been in, in church for 90 years because they don't understand the importance of spiritual maturity. Paul says, I have not yet arrived at perfection. I know I got some issues. I know I got some problems. Some of us don't even believe we got any. But you ought to look at yourself and some things ought not get to you like they used to. When you first started out, you might have kind of worried about things. Some of y'all grown to the point now, lies don't bother you. Gossip doesn't bother you. Yeah, and I'm serious. You know, that was a time you started out, you want everybody to love you. And you just couldn't sleep because this person was looking at you funny. And now, 
you know, you start growing. You, they look at you for the now and you say, oh, there's something wrong with my hair. <laughs> Paul here is stating to us that he has not come to a place in his Christian life where growth of spiritual maturity has now been completed. And that's why I tell y'all, if you ain't growing, you in the wrong place. Are y'all hearing me? And I, I, I love you dearly, but if you ain't growing here, go where you're growing. I mean, why, why would I want somebody to remain stagnant in the field and, and it just been like that for years? I just told you Sunday. I don't own sheep. What bothers me more than anything with us as a race of people, we don't talk. If you felt led by the, if you feel led by the Lord to say, I, I, I need to go someplace else. Go. I'm not, I'm not trying to be funny. What can I do the whole year anyway? And if I do anything, you ain't staying based on him. You stand based on me. And I'm going to let you down. <sighs> Listen to this. If Paul, no, not if. Since Paul is labeled one of the greatest apostles, 30 some years of service with God, with Jesus, made this statement. How much more should we as Christians say, if Paul didn't do this, I know I can't. And this man wrote over half the New Testament. And he's the one saying, I, I ain't arrived yet. I got some room left. I got some things God wants to get out of me. Am I making any sense to you? Do, do you not? Un so when you have lack of commitment, you shortchanging you. And the hardest time to be committed is when it ain't easy. Boy, y'all. Paul made this statement predicated on two things. I want y'all to write it in your notes. The first reason that Paul made this statement is based on the difficulty of the flesh. <laughs> What is Paul saying? Paul is saying, I know I'm saved, but I'm also in a messed up house. And it's a constant struggle with my flesh. I mean, it never passed. I want to do right. Evil is always present. Then there are times that I know to do right and I can't explain why I did wrong. Amen. It's a struggle. A struggle. <laughs> do y'all know how rough it is living in this old body? Stuff you thought you had nipped. Doc, you just ain't been in the kitchen yet where the real heat has been to determine whether that part of you is truly dead. No, it ain't dead. Because you hear me say, you, you have to learn how to hide the buttons. Hide them buttons because them buttons will make themselves know if the right person at the right time caught you on a bad day in the right moment, to do the wrong thing, they got you. 
That's all it takes. And it's so easy to happen. That's why you have to be careful when you stand up and say, I don't do that no more. You might not do that, but you resurrected this. All I'm trying to get us to understand is Paul recognized that there were difficulties with his flesh. Second and final one. That is, Paul realized the absolute impossibility of exhausting Christ. Listen to me. He couldn't use him up. Now, that won't be enough. Make you scream. Don't you know, if God looked at us and looked in your face and said, you getting on my nerves. I don't think I can serve him. I can't serve a God that a Negro can get on his nerves. I'm just being honest. What would happen if God said, hold it, hold it, hold it. Don't talk to me right now. I'm busy. I got 10 other folks, somebody in New York, somebody in Florida, and let me finish with them and I'll holler back at you. What would we do? But I dropped by to tell you, you can't exhaust him. Can I prove it? Yeah, he says I'm Alpha and Omega. And that means from beginning and there is no end, you can't use him up in the middle. Boy, that's enough to make you holler. So Paul is saying in essence, I know that I have not arrived. I know I don't have everything. I'm not perfected yet. But I also know I'm, I'm struggling with this flesh. But I thank God I can't exhaust him. Boy, that's it. Whew. I know sometimes y'all look at me like he got to be out of his mind. But have you ever gone to God about the same thing over and over again? And God keep fixing it and we break it and he fix it again? That's good news. And then you sit back sometime and just shout and cry all by yourself. Because you know without a doubt, if it had not been for God, it never would have gotten done. (laughs) All right. I'm going to go ahead, Sister Paul, and give them the third one. So that they have it in their nose, and this is where we'll start. Here's the deal. He had not done everything. He had not what? Done. Back up in your notes. He had not received everything. He had not become everything. And now he had not done everything. And that's when we're going to play with, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Jesus Christ had also laid hold of me. Yes. Now that's commitment, Doc. Hallelujah. See, we're going to talk next Wednesday night about the danger of not knowing how to press. Because you can't be pretty and know how to press. So when you sometimes come to church and see somebody and they, they, they into it, don't be so quick. The holler, I ain't nothing to it. You don't know the hell that person been dealing with. They just might be doing some pressing. Let me, let me stop before I get into it. I don't, all right? All on commitment. This is all on commitment. Okay? Okay.